Um, I'm going to present some of our work from the Torres Strait. <coughs> um, today, unfortunately, Vic, Mick, Vic McGrath was meant to come and present with us, but he wasn't able to, so he's from uh, Torres Strait Regional Authority. Um, and also uh, Simon Apti, who's the other main co-leader in this project from um, CSIRO, located in Sydney. Uh, so this was a compilation of outcomes from three projects undertaken through NEST. So uh, we had one looking at influence, another one looking more at metals in the first round, and then we combined them with the extension in the second component, um, representing a large team. Uh, also wanted to mention that um, John Brodie was always the science leader for this work and I was sort of the project leader and John led the science part, so <clears throat> it's been quite challenging doing the final write-up. Okay, just a bit of background to the Fly River and why it's important. So it's the second largest river in New Guinea. It's also the um, 17th largest river in the world, so it's massive. Um, when you think about the sorts of discharges it gets, it's similar to what some of the GBR rivers see in a day. Uh, sorry, in, what it sees in one day is what some of the GBR rivers see in one year. Um, it's quite constant throughout the year, so it's less seasonal. There's less variation than what we might see in the reef. Um, <clears throat> it receives mine discharges from two mines, so Octeti that started in the 80s and then Paul Gregold mine that started in the 90s. Um, and it discharges largely into the Gulf of Papua, so a huge amount of sediment, 120 million tonnes of sediment into the Gulf every year, and they estimate that that's increased, um, that incorporates an increase of about 40% since the Octeti mine started, so it dis discharges its tailings into the Fly River. Um, the uh, there's been work done over the years in the region. The impacts are very noticeable. Um, you can see the increase in sediment in the Fly River itself and the estuary, and there's been um, elevated uh, concentrations of copper, which is a byproduct of the treatment process from the tailings. Uh, just highlighting in the map there, so you can see the Fly River is that massive estuary here, and then the Torres Strait area, which we were interested in below that. So the contaminants in the Fly River, Syro has done a lot of work on this over the years. Um, so they've had a look particularly at the copper, and on the right here we show the changes in dissolved copper concentrations. Um, so you, on the bottom is the, in the red, sorry. Yep, oops. That wrong button. The lowest one is the, um, the uh, from, from the beginning pr prior to the mine or in the early stages of the mine and then as each uh, increment is as we've increased over time. So those concentrations of dissolved copper have increased in the estuary as well as the particulate copper in the um, estuarine environment. So the... Um, Increases have really have been attributed to that discharge of the mine tailings into the Fly River. So the issue is for the Torres Strait communities that during certain conditions that discharge from the Fly River enters the Torres Strait region. Um, over 30 years, I guess, the, there's been increasing and ongoing concerns about what that might mean for their communities in terms of environmental and human health. Um, of course, increased sediment, have we have learnings from the Great Barrier Reef of what the impacts might be, and we heard a bit about that yesterday, but there's important seagrass communities in the Torres Strait, um, which are dependent on by other species, turtle dugong. Um, reduced light can have an effect on those, also on the coral communities, and uh, can also influence fish behaviour. In terms of the trace metals, it has an impact potentially on fertilisation success in corals, reproductivity, um, and also, uh, again, it's um, in increased susceptibility to bleaching, so another one of those things that um, makes it harder for corals and other species to tolerate higher temperatures. Um, and then in extreme cases, they've measured, you know, not in the Torres Strait, but in experimental work, mortality in invertebrates and fish. So 
not something that you particularly want in the environment. Um, some work was done in the early 90s, the Torres Strait Baseline Study, which provides an excellent reference for this work. And at that time, they looked at metals in seafood, sediment and water. Um, uh, sorry, seafood, sediment and seagrass. And at that time, there was no link between the elevated metal concentrations that they found and the mining activity. So metals can be naturally high in some of these areas. So this project used uh, multiple lines of evidence approach. So we had, um, in the first phase, Janice Luff did some looking at some historic coral cores, um, particularly at Arab uh, Island and Bramble Key. Uh, we had the TSR rangers involved in weekly salinity monitoring in a number of locations, so both in the north and the central part of the Torres Strait. They did that since 2017. They continue to do it even though the projects have initially finished. Um, we had Scott Bainbridge leading some work with some continuous, mon uh, mod continuous loggers of turbidity, salinity and temperature. So that was at Massig, Bramble Key, and then last year there was one in at Warrior Reefs as well, um, which is, these are all locations in the northern Torres Strait. Um, there's the hydrodynamic and sediment transport modelling led by Eric Walansky, and that uh, basically distributes the... First of all, was just where the water went and then where the mud goes in the region from the Fly River. Uh, there's a remote sensing component that Caroline Pettis led. Um, she built on the methods that we use in the Great Barrier Reef. She looked particularly at turbidity uh, and also applied an algorithm of looking at suspended sediment concentrations, and that was used in conjunction with the modelling. And then we had the major component of the field samples of the actual metal analysis in water, sediment and seagrass. Um, we had a number of major campaigns. We were quite hindered by the COVID restrictions last year. Uh, we missed out on our... Um, monsoon season uh, sampling period and ended up doing our final field work in December last year, so it's been interesting times. Oh, I should mention too, we had a couple of other components that we trialled through the project. So we looked at uh, genomics uh, analysis of sediment composition. Um, we looked at oysters and um, also uh, DGTs, so they're like passive samplers for trace metals. Uh, they were sort of decided not to be continued because of various issues, largely logistical, getting up there that many times. Whoops. So there's three main parts that we present in our report of the key findings. So one of the questions is really about where does the water go? Um, what do we understand about that? Then the assessment of the mining-derived contaminants in those areas. And then finally, we attempted an exposure assessment. So in terms of the extent of influence, this map shows a very crude and uh, simple slide picture of where we understand the water to go. So um, as I said, it's very large, it flows year round, so we don't see those events or the wet season like we would see up here. Um, the water carries fine sediments and contaminants, but you can see the sediments obviously in the satellite imagery. Uh, during the southeast trade wind season, which is the Sega season, uh, it tends to move west. Um, so, oop, I keep doing that, sorry. Along the coast, uh, towards as far west as um, Boigal and Saibai. Uh, during the monsoon season, it tends to move for sort of an east southeasterly direction, so into the Gulf and at times uh, into around Bramble Key and further south. And then you get this periodic movement south depending on the wind conditions and weather. Uh, so we do, we've seen that in multiple of the uh, components of the project that we assessed. Um, those southern movements are less predictable. We see uh, periodic influence around Massig Island here, and you typically don't see much influence as you move further south. So there's a bit of a gradient from the PNG coast down to the central Torres Strait, and as you get further down to places like Thursday Island, you don't really see any influence at all. Um, there is this uh, issue of trying to differentiate between the fly river discharge and resuspension. So 
Uh, it's a very windy region uh, seasonally, so you get a lot of reef suspension at different times of the year. So trying to disentangle that using the imagery um, was supported by also collecting salinity data. So you can have a look at the freshwater influence and where that coincides with higher turbidity. Um, we also understand that it's not all from the Fly River. So there's a number of um, smaller rivers on the PNG mainland that contribute as well to that discharge. And um, we don't really have the data to support uh, that further analysis of that aspect. The, as I said, the coral core work at Bramble Key it showed periodic influence at least once a year of fresh water to Bramble Key. That can't be attributed to anything else. So um, that's part of the evidence of that Fly River discharge at getting as far as Bramble Key. Um, the salinity monitoring showed really distinct patterns. So, um, oh, did it again. Uh, these, this shows that these are just box plots of the salinity results. So up here is around 35, which you would expect for normal marine, and down here is around uh, just under 30. Um, so Boy Goose by, which are over in the west, we're seeing quite low salinity, and this is an average of the weekly samples. Um, and as you move into these central areas, you see it slowly returning back to um, what you'd expect for oceanic waters. Um, so that was a really useful contribution from the rangers to assist in doing that throughout the project. The loggers showed regular peaks um, in turbidity at Bramble Key, periodically at Massig, and then also at the Warrior Reefs, which is... Uh, Oh, it's not shown on any of those maps. I'll show you in a second. It's sort of in between the two. Um, really important seagrass habitat and for local communities as well. Um, the suspended sediment concentrations are similar to those measured uh, in 1995. So we know they haven't changed too much. They're not increasing, which is reassuring. Um, they typically can be quite high and they are correlated with salinity. Um, but those levels, I mean, in a lot of our field work, it was less than 10 milligrams per litre, which is not that different to what you might see in some of the inshore GBR. All of that was matched up with remote sensing data, so we're fairly confident in this part of the results. The modelling um, showed here, uh, you get this new material coming from the Fly River and it gets diluted with an existing mud wedge, so you can imagine all, a lot of material came out of the Fly River historically as well. So you've had that build up in the region over time. You get this contaminated mud mixing with that diluting. Um, and Eric showed that there was a hydrodynamic barrier around this area. So you're not getting as much material being carried across to Boigu and Saibai. He did some predictions of how long it would, it would, you would estimate that it would take for... Um, that material to move from the fly across to Saibai, and it's pretty slow. Um, so we don't have too many concerns about the future outlook of, for the region either. With the mine-derived contaminants, they looked at, or Simon's team looked at, water sediment and seagrass samples. Um, generally, the water quality and sediment quality is very good, uh, which was good news. Um, there were some elevated concentrations of trace metals in the northern parts, so Bramble Key in particular, the northern Warrior Reefs and Boigu and Saibai. Um, the dissolved metal concentrations were all below the Australian New Zealand Marine Water Quality Guidelines for the 95% species protection, but at Boigu and Saibai we saw some exceedances of the 99% um, guideline, which is, I guess, what you'd expect for uh, pristine, uncontaminated waters. So, Whilst that's, I guess, our area of highest concern, it's still relatively low concentrations by other standards. Uh, this map shows what some of those concentrations were, and I don't know if you can read them, um, but I just wanted to highlight. So on the left is the dissolved copper, and on the right is the... Um, particulate or bent thick copper concentrations. Um, what we've shown is there's a real distinction between that northern part closer to the PNG coast and the southern part of the Torres Strait and there's a boundary really which um, Simon's identified 
in that change, um, which matches what we see with turbidity and salinity as well. Um, their highest concentrations, as I said, are over here, uh, around Boigu and Saibai, and that's, as I said, where we're getting exceedance of this 99% guideline value. So just in case you can't see, those concentrations are up around 500, 600 um, nanograms per litre. The bottom graph is uh, concentrations of copper in seagrass, and we see a similar gradient. I assure you of that, you won't be able to read the text. Um, but we saw similar patterns in sediment as we did in the seagrass leaves. As I said, it's really important though, these are all relative when we talk about the concentrations being high in Boigu and Saibai, they are high relative to other locations in the Torres Strait. And when you look at them in, in um, conjunction with uh, the global and other results, then it's really representing concentrations from a fairly unpolluted environment. So the metal enrichment, I'm trying to tease where that comes from, is a little bit harder. Um, it's Simon and his team have concluded that it's largely probably from the PNG mainland. Over at Boigu and Saibai, there's a number of small rivers that contribute into that area. Um, but we do see this periodic influence from the Fly River plume as well. So it's a combination of act, um, inputs. Um, the relative contribution, we can't tease that out until we could do some work more in the actual Torres Strait, uh, sorry, in the PNG rivers, um, which is not possible through NEST funding. You can't work in PNG. Um, the elevated metal concentrations are most likely associated with the Fly River plume in the northeast Torres Strait and Bramble Key in particular. So they were those areas over. Um, to the east and southeast of the um, Fly River estuary. Um, and the benthic sediments, I think, importantly, don't appear to be accumulating the mine derived sediments. So that's really what we were wanting to know. Are we seeing changes over time as the mine operates for longer? Um, we looked at this in comparison, the Torres Strait baseline study results. Um, most of the results were comparable and we've even got an example in Bramble Key where they were significantly higher in the baseline study. We think this is because of some um, dynamics in the uh, deposition of fine sediment in Bramble Key. Um, we don't fully understand that and more work would be required. Uh, this graph just here, I'll just show you, this is the Bramble Key site um, in the baseline study compared to our two studies in 16 and 20. So it's a significant difference. When you get fine sediment, uh, finer sediments, more fine sediments, you get more binding of copper to that material. So it would be, could be partly due to that change in the composition. Um, to bring it all together, we did a, I guess, a relatively simple exposure assessment. Bearing in mind we have no um, ecosystem condition data, we have a little bit. Um, uh, unfortunately, in the Torres Strait, there's a lot of uh, ecosystem monitoring that occurs on a regular basis, so we used what we could. Um, we looked at a number of factors, including the exposure to the Fly River discharge, and we, it was all relative. So we said it was either the highest, the moderate, or the lowest. Um, we categorised the mine-derived pollution, whether or not it exceeded the guidelines, and then we had um, the potential threats based on the presence of ecosystems. That was really just, are there important ecosystems in that region, and uh, how are the concentrations compared to what we've seen in terms of effects levels, either in the GBR or other locations. So the map on the right just highlights our um, priority areas. Uh, as I described, more so in the northern Torres Strait. Um, we've got this sort of transition zone in the areas around Masig, um, Erebanuga, and then these central islands uh, have very low influence from the Fly River discharge. So in conclusion, um, I won't reiterate that point again, um, but we do have fairly high confidence in where we think the Fly River water goes. 
Um, it's generally very good water quality and sediment quality across the region, apart from in those areas um, further to the west around Boigo, Saibai, Bramble Key and Northern Warrior Reefs, and they're all very important ecosystems, so that's important. Um, however, that we're not seeing any increases over time. So since the early 90s, the concentrations haven't gone up, so I think that's a good story. Um, as I said, we weren't able to quantify that link between the uh, what we're seeing in terms of metals and increase, oh, I guess the higher turbidity and ecosystem response. Um, however, with the metal concentrations that are being measured, we, we sort of concluded we're not sure that that's a, of a significant concern. And I would suggest that there's probably other issues of greater concern in the Torres Strait that I would recommend for further work. Um, for future work, though, I guess if um, we really wanted to build our confidence in, the, uh, in that story and to lay this to bed for good, um, you'd need to do that work in PNG. So to really trace it back to the sources, Simon's team did do some tracing. Um, it, and it indicated that there was very little movement beyond that area that I showed around Bristow, where you sort of get that hydrodynamic blockage, if you like. Um, I think that would be a useful exercise to just clarify the link uh, between the metal concentrations, particularly around Boigu and Saibai. Um, there's a weird pattern around Northern Warrior Reef, and that's a really important ecological area. So that's... Um, we saw this strange monthly cycle of low salinity. So in an area like that, it's about... 20, 30 kilometres from the PNG coast. It could be a freshwater influence from there. Um, it could be a tidal thing and you get uh, sort of bigger water movement from those tidal uh, movements down into that area. So given that Warrior Reef is a very important um, area for the local community, that would probably be one of the higher priorities. Um, the same with Bramble Key uh, and along the PNG coastline. But we've identified that once you've teased out that issues, this is probably something you'd want to repeat every five or ten years. A bit like, um, I guess, the baseline study was longer ago than that. Um, but I think that something like that would be sufficient. That multiple lines of evidence approach has been really important, um, given the variability in, in these factors. And then the, the ranger involvement has been a huge and significant benefit to the project. So having their engagement, um, they've got a lot out of it, we've got a lot out of it, uh, and we'd like to continue to do it. As I said, they're still monitoring. Hopefully we can use that data, but it's been a really valuable component of the project. We've got lots of acknowledgements, so I won't go through them all because I'm over time, but just to thank um, particularly the rangers and the local communities for their support. They've supported us with a lot of the field work. And then just finally, uh, recognising John for his work in the Torres Strait. So the, the picture on the left there is John in one of, um, this is his favourite photo, I think, of one of our field trips that must have been around 2014. And the others are all of the work that he actually did in the Torres Strait Baseline Study. So you might recognise some of the faces there as well. So thank you. <laughs>